As many of you know, the fifth chapter of Matthew, the first 12 verses, is called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes basically mean blessing. And they really are Jesus' description about how he understands how we have been blessed. And therefore, then, we are to understand what those blessings are to mean to us, how we can put them into practice, how it is that we are to live. Then, as you well know, the next three chapters, or excuse me, the three chapters in Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is what is also called the entire Sermon on the Mount. For many people, this is Jesus' masterpiece. For a lot of folks, the Sermon on the Mount is the critical core of what Christianity is all about. As I was looking at those three chapters, I reminded myself of the conversation that a Christian had with Mahatma Gandhi uh, some years ago. Gandhi, of course, was a Hindu. He was asked the question, though, Gandhi, do you think you could ever consider yourself to be a Christian? He thought about that for a moment, and he said this. Well, if I was to think of being a Christian as someone who follows the Sermon on the Mount, then I think I could say, yes, I'm a Christian. But the problem is so much of what passes for Christianity is a negation of the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know whether I can call myself a Christian or not. Some of you maybe have heard the phrase text and context. That means basically, for instance, an example, say you got a text on your phone. You read it and it was a little kind of odd, maybe even a bit disturbing. You wondered why did that person use those words and the emotions that you thought were behind those words. But if you took time or had the time or could find the time to try to understand the context in which that text was written, then it might make a bit more sense, right? So one of the things that we need to realize in scripture is that sometimes when we look at a text like our Matthew text today, it might help us by understanding the context of what Jesus thought about the law so that we can have a better understanding of this Matthew account of what the law meant to Jesus. Jesus, you'll remember, is Jewish. He was often called rabbi. Rabbi meant that, in essence, he is a teacher and instructor of the law. So he's going to have a thought or two about that. Now, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So what did he mean by that? In the Old Testament, you may remember, there are 613 practices, rules, regulations that a good Jew is to follow. That means in those 613 practices, there are things like ethical rules, how a Jew should live a normal everyday life, and there are also what are called ceremonial rules, and that is how it is that a Jew should worship, kind of dietary laws, things that you should eat and not eat, cleansing laws in terms of how you can make sure that your pots and pans and you yourself are clean before you participate in something. Other kinds of rituals and rules, they all totaled, at least by the scholars of the Old Testament, some 613 practices. I would imagine for most of us, we kind of carry with us the stereotype that most Christians have about the Jewish laws, thinking that 613 prohibitions, wow, that's just a lot of prohibitions, a lot of limitations that are just heaped up on people, okay? It's kind of like driving, and I think the speed limit out here on this is 40 miles an hour, okay? So the law is you're only to go 40 miles an hour, right? Now, I know some of you don't observe that law, okay? But that's the law. If you got pulled over for speeding, in essence, the judge would say, what's the speed limit? What's the law? 40, okay? You transgress that law, so here's the penalty. So a lot of times when we look at the law, it's kind of like, here are the prohibitions and here are the penalties that come along with all of that. Jesus, though, wants to say that the Jews, for the Jews, the law is really God's lifeline to them, okay? 
These were not just a bunch of prohibitions and limitations placed on them. This was actually the lifeline of how a good Jew understood what it meant to be in a right relationship with God, how it is that they were supposed to, in essence, live. It is actually a freeing up for them to be able to say, I don't have to figure this out on my own. The reality of the law helps me understand what I'm supposed to do day in and day out. So Jesus' own attitude about the law would be very, very important for the Jewish Christians that Matthew was writing to, to have them understand what did Jesus think about all these laws. And again, the law occupied a central part of the Jewish faith. For them, their past, their present, and their future did not make any sense to them without the law. The law was perfect and unchangeable, and so Jesus, in essence, said, I've not come to bring a new law, but rather I've come to bring a new interpretation of the law, okay? That's what's really important for us to understand about the law and Jesus, and particularly in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is not saying, I'm bringing a new law because no Jew expected a Messiah to bring a new law, but rather Jesus was saying, I'm bringing a new interpretation of what the law is all about. And that's why I created the uh, sermon title, What Does It Mean to Be a Law-Abiding Christian? Okay, So that's what we're going to spend a few more moments trying to figure out. How does Jesus help us understand the role of the law in our life? Now, Jesus was basically thinking that um, he was rejected by the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the way he was beginning to interpret the law. They were his rival teachers, and most of the time they spent trying to, in essence, defame him or to deny him any credibility about being a rabbi that one ought to listen to. For Matthew, the rival teachers, though, had a very sub-understanding of the law and needed a new interpretation, and Matthew was saying, Jesus has brought that, so we need to listen to him. But again, the rival interpretation said, in essence, Jesus is just getting in the way. He is defaming the law. He is not interpreting it correctly. Therefore, what can we do to destroy his credibility? I think Jesus' basic assumption and premise about the importance of the law was that he was trying to say, I want to get back to God's original intent of the law. And by that, he meant that deeds and acts of righteousness are really internal factors that happen within us, like mercy, kindness, and justice. And once we realize that those gifts or blessings have been given to us, then we have the capacity to live in a sense of mercy, kindness, and justice. Does that make sense? So the Beatitudes are basically Jesus saying, okay, you have been given gifts. You have been given internal characteristics of which you now can live. And those basic gifts that come from the law is God's mercy, God's kindness, God's justice, or the fair treating of God with you and with everyone. Remember when Jesus says about the law, I require mercy, not sacrifice. For Jesus, mercy was the pivotal point about what the law was all to be about. When Jesus says, I require mercy, not sacrifice, he's basically saying, I want to remind you what the law is trying to remind you, that God has given these internal gifts and blessings to you, and now you can use them to live life the way God wants you to live, okay? So sometimes we think that um, we have to give to God before we get from God. But the law is basically saying, no, your relationship with God is this. You get from God before you have to give to God. Does that make sense? Okay? Sometimes the law is fess up, own up, do this. Jesus is saying with mercy, justice, kindness, and the well-being of all, that actually God gives to you these things so that you can internalize them and to begin to live the way that God wants you to live. So oftentimes when Jesus criticized the law, 
when he got into kind of a fuss over the faith of the law with all the other scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, he basically was saying this. If the law gets in my way from trying to show the all-encompassing love of God to everyone, then I'm going to fight it. I'm going to, in essence, say, that's not right, the understanding of the law. If the law basically doesn't allow me to help people that are hurting, that are dealing with hardships in life, and the law says I can't do that, for instance, heal somebody on the Sabbath, then I'm going to criticize the law. I'm going to negate the importance of that law. I'm going to come up with a different understanding, a different interpretation. So Jesus has this profound passion of trying to make sure that everybody understands that they are included in the fold of faith for God. And wherever hardship or hurt happens in the life of anyone, anywhere, Jesus is going to intervene by trying to bring mercy, kindness, justice, fairness into their lives. That's, I think, what Jesus is really trying to push. For some people, if you look at the law, you'd say, well, huh, seems to me that God is just kind of a bookkeeper just trying to evaluate everybody who has done the right things and less of the wrong things. And therefore, in that evaluation, I'm going to tell you who is important and who is not. But it's almost then as if we are saying, the law is only useful when it tells us who we think God considers to be outsiders and insiders. But for Jesus, there was no such thing as an outsider. For Jesus, they were all insiders, it's just that the law wasn't helping them to understand how much they were a part of God's life. So, do you remember when Jesus basically says the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to get into the kingdom of God before the religious elites? How do you think that went over? It did not, okay? Or the Good Samaritan story, that a Samaritan of all people, for most Jews, a Samaritan was simply a pagan, didn't believe in God in the right way, therefore God didn't believe in the Samaritan, but it was the Samaritan, Jesus said, who did what was right, who took on the challenge and the risk of showing mercy. And in the end of that story, do you recall, Jesus asked the person he was talking to, the guy that was helped was actually Jewish, he said, who did the right thing? And the person couldn't say a Samaritan. I mean, they were that offended by the Samaritan race that the only thing could say, okay, the one who showed mercy, and that was the Samaritan. So Jesus constantly tries to uh, involve himself in oftentimes a conflict with the Jewish leaders, but trying to tell them that in fact, the purpose of the law is not to say who's on the inside and who's on the outside, the purpose of the law is to bring mercy, kindness, and justice to all those who need it, and everyone is in need of that. God's original intent of mercy, love, humility means that observing ceremonial obligations are not that important. It's kind of like saying this, going to church is not enough. Going to church is not enough because Jesus expects us to work for God and with God through this coming week. So, let's remember what worship is all about. Worship is about revelation and response. Revelation comes from the reading of scripture, hopefully the sermon, maybe in um, sharing a, of a hymn, we hear God's word that comes to us. That's the revelation. What's the response? What we do with all that for the coming week. That's what true worship is revelation and response. So Jesus asked the question, or basically means the statement, you are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Salt of the earth and the light of the world. Emerson Powery asked this question, what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? And this is what he said. It means that you are to be humble, you are to mourn, you are to be meek, and you are to hunger and thirst for what is right to do, okay? Humble, mourn, meek, and doing, thirsting for hunger and justice and righteousness. Now, humble, boy, that's a hard one. Don't you think? I remember talking to a guy and said he thought he was humble. In fact, he was proud of his humility. <laughs> 
Not quite sure that's what Jesus had in mind. Maybe a little bit more, uh, this adage, that uh, why do angels, are angels able to fly? Because they take themselves so lightly. <laughs> so humility is something that's important for us to be able to carry on in the conviction of our Christian faith. We are to take ourselves seriously, but equally we are to take others seriously as well. And those who are able to mourn, boy, to me it takes really a profound person that has the capacity to mourn with other people. Sometimes it's hard enough just to mourn for ourselves, but to enter into the mourning of another person, it can be very, very challenging, but very spiritually enriching. And that's what Jesus' part meant, here it is to be the salt of the earth. And then to be meek. Jesus was not meek and mild, was he? There were some moments where he was outrageously mad at lots of people, even the disciples. The Apostle Paul one time wrote in his uh, letter to Galatians, the third chapter, Paul says, you stupid Galatians. So we need to remind ourselves that being meek is not being mild, but being meek means that in essence, we are open and sensitive to the well-being of others. And in that meekness, even though we may not be able to do anything about it, we can see how people are suffering. And the meekness means that I've just kind of put myself, the center of myself, aside, and it allows then other people or other situations to come into our lives. And then the hunger and thirst for righteousness, okay? By doing what is right in the world by having the confidence that God has confidence in you to do the kind of work that God thinks needs to be done. Jesus invites us to a deeper way of life. And when he asks us about who are the light, the light are just simply folks like all of you where you do deeds and acts of mercy and peace. And you don't fear living this way because living this way has brought so much joy to your life that you have decided you wouldn't want to live any other way as well. I kind of like this notion about the salt of the earth. It says being salt means that you are basically trying to be a spiritual seasoning to other people. And being a spiritual seasoning means that you have brought joy, the joy of God, into the life of the world. That's what it means to be the salt of the earth. And to be the light of the world means that wherever you see darkness or despair, you try to take the light of your life into that situation and see whether the light of God might shine a bit into that darkness and into that despair. Just a moment of personal privilege, if I might. Several years ago, I was serving as the full-time pastor of this congregation for about 10 months. Many, many kind of memories that I enjoyed with all of you, but one that kind of sticks out particularly about light of the world we were celebrating our Christmas Eve service, and uh, it seemed like that a few more folks showed up than we thought were coming. But at the very end of the service, we all had our little light lit candle. And um, after we had them all lit, we lifted them up. And I remember just being astounded about the spiritual blaze and warmth that one could see in this sanctuary when all the lights were lifted. And it was, yes, we're going to sing this little light of mine. But when we all got together and lifted them together, then we realized how much light of the world we can actually bring into us. Jesus, I think, invites us to a deeper way of life, the righteous way of life, where we internalize the gifts of mercy, kindness, and justice. And it seems to me, when we are able to do that, we can say of ourselves, we are a law-abiding Christian. Amen.